able to do whatever it is that you've called them to do, especially our pastor, Father, Sunday service coming up, that he would be rested and be able to just teach your word. And I pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, Shaney, come on up. Okay, let's pray. Uh, dear Father, Lord Almighty, I just want to thank you ever, ever, ever so much for giving me this opportunity. I'm always praying and saying, you know, God give me an opportunity to teach, so I'm grateful that my uh, chance has come. So I just pray, Father Lord Almighty, that you will be with my mouth. Please be with my mouth. Keep my mind focused on what I should say. And um, just pray that the um, hearts and minds of the people here will be blessed by what they hear t uh, tonight. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, uh, the book of Revelation. And I, I remember when I was... Uh, when I first became a Christian, that was the very first book, was one of the first books that I read. And why did I read the book of Revelation? Wow, it's all about the future, it's all about the end times. And it's like you get a, you get a book and you can't wait to get to the end of the book because you want to know what the ending is. But then you read the book of Revelation and then you think, well, wait, wait a minute, <laughs> what does it mean? <laughs> what does that mean? What does this mean? What does that mean? And but for that reason, a lot of people don't read the book of uh, Revelation because they're afraid to read it because there's all kinds of scary images in the book of Revelation and they think, oh, no, I won't read it. I'll, I'll, I'll just leave that one alone. But in Revelation 1 verse 3, John said, Blessed is he who reads and those who hear the words of this prophecy and keep those things which are written in it for the time is near. Also, in Revelation 22, verse 7, Jesus also said, Behold, I come quickly. Blessed is he who keeps the words of the prophecy of this book. So we are told, read the book. This is the only book in the Bible where we're actually encouraged by the Lord to read. I have titled my study, Questions About the End Times. Now my goal tonight is to give biblically and factually supported answers you know, to some of the questions that, that I know I had when I was a new believer, and I know that some of you have probably had and might still have about the book of Revelation. I am praying to God that I will have time to get through everything that I have uh, you know, prepared, you know, prepared tonight. So in order to save time and to get through as many questions as I possibly can get through, I'm gonna be throwing out a lot of uh, scriptural references, but I am not going to have the time to read through them. So therefore I encourage you all to make note of the scriptural references that I'll be giving. Now, I want you seriously to be Berean Christians here and that you go, you go and check and verify that everything that I say is true. When I, every, anytime I give a study, I always say, don't trust anything that I say. Trust the Word of God. Go and check it for yourself. Don't just take it because somebody told you. So that way it keeps me honest and it also ensures that you also are keeping yourself in, you know, in the truth. So the questions that I'm going to give my best effort to answer tonight are, who is the woman that rides the beast? Who is the beast, or who is better known as the Antichrist? Who are the ten kings? Remember the woman on the beast? The beast had ten horns. Well, the ten horns we later discover are ten kings, so I'm going to try to get, you know, reveal who those 10 kings may be. Who are the 144,000? Who are the two witnesses that will be preaching the gospel you know, during the tribulation period? Who is the false prophet? 
what is the mark of the beast? And that's the, that's the question that has, to me, has, other than who is the Antichrist, the second most popular question that you get out, that people will say about Revelation is, what is the mark of the beast? What is it? What is it? What is it, it going to be? So I'm going to do my best to give you a, a, a biblically sound answer for that. And the last question I will try to answer is, who is Mystery Babylon? So, first question, who is the woman that, who rides the beast? And uh, to answer that question, we would need to go to Revelation 17, because that's, that is where we first, where, where we see her, Revelation 17. And I will read the first uh, six verses. Give you a couple of seconds to get there, and then, and then I'll start reading. Revelation 17. And it says, Then one of the seven angels, who had the seven bowls, came and talked with me, saying to me, Come, and I will show you the judgment of the great harlot who sits on many waters, with whom the kings of the earth committed fornication, and the inhabitants of the earth were made drunk with the wine of her fornication. So he carried me away in the spirit into the wilderness, and I saw a woman sitting on a scarlet beast which was full of names of blasphemy, having seven heads and ten horns. The woman was arrayed in purple and scarlet and adorned with gold and precious stones and pearls, having, a, having in her hand a golden cup full of abominations and the filthiness of her fornication, and on her head a name was written, Mystery, Babylon the Great, Mother of Harlots, and of, the and of the abominations of the earth. And I saw the woman drunk with the blood of the saints and with the blood of the martyrs of Jesus. And when I saw her, I marveled with amazement. I marveled with great amazement. So in these six verses, we're introduced to this uh, woman riding, riding a beast. And the questions, obviously, that follow are, who is this woman, and who is the beast that she is riding upon? Well, the clues that we are given is, is that she is you know, dressed in purple and scarlet, and that she's carrying a golden cup in her hands. What we can get from this is that this woman represents a pagan religious system. Women in, in scriptures are always, uh, you know, uh, religion in scripture is always given a female gender. And therefore, if we go to Exodus 34 verses 12 to 16, in those verses, God gives the children of Israel a warning not to play the harlot, not to go after foreign gods, not to, fo not to go after the, and worship the gods of the Canaanites. In Nahum, chapter 3, verses 4 to 7, we see that God pronounces a judgment upon the nation of Nineveh. And this is the same judgment that he pronounces on the woman in Revelation chapter 18. Because like the woman who is riding the beast, the city of Nineveh was also guilty of spiritual harlotry. And, at, in, and at, it got to the point where God finally said, I've had enough, and he decided to wipe out Nineveh as a nation. Returning to Revelation 17, I'll read verses 7 and 8. It says, But the angel said to me, Why did you marvel? I will tell you the mystery of the woman and of the beast that carries her, which has the seven heads and the ten horns. The beast that you saw was and is not and will ascend out of the bottomless pit and go into perdition. And those who dwell on the earth will marvel whose names are not written in the book of life, from the, in the Lamb's book of life, from the foundation of the world. When they see the beast that was and is not and yet is. I just want to take a break here from, from, you know, from the woman. 
because there's another mysterious group of beings or people that are, that are mentioned here. Revelation 17, 8 say, uh, talks about a group of people who are not written in the Lamb's Book of Life from the foundation of the world. Who are these people? And where did they come from? Now, the only reason why some, you know, somebody's name would not be written in the Lamb's Book of Life from the foundation of the world would mean that they, were, they never should have existed to begin with. Because if that's not the case, then Calvinism, the Calvinistic belief that, we are predest that some are predestined to go to heaven and some are predestined to go to hell would be true. And if that were the case, then the biggest promise that God made to the world would be false. And that promise being that for God so loved the world that whosoever should believe in him should not perish but have eternal life. So who are these people? In order to answer this question, we need to go back to, Revel uh, to, back to Genesis. In Genesis, uh, verse, uh, six, from, uh, uh, Genesis 6, verse uh, 1 and 7, we read about the angel of the sons of God coming down to earth and taking uh, wives of the daughters of men and having children with them and those children growing up to become giants. Genesis 1.9 says that Noah was perfect in his generation. Now when, now when Genesis says that Noah was perfect in his generation, Genesis is not saying that Noah was without sin or that he, was, he never did anything wrong because we know he did because in Genesis chapter 8 he got drunk. So what does it mean when it says that Noah was perfect in his generation? If we read further down Genesis chapter 6 verses 11 to 12, it says, The earth also was corrupt before God, and the earth was filled with violence. So God looked upon the earth, and indeed it was corrupt, for all flesh had corrupted their way on the earth. When the Bible says that all flesh had corrupted its way, it literally means all flesh. But it says here that Noah was perfect. So when it says perfect, the word perfect means he was genetically perfect. His flesh had not been corrupted. You see, what was really going on in the days of Noah was as there, there was a group of fallen, uh, uh, fallen angels that came down not only did they mate with women and take wives to have children, but what they were also doing is, is they were also seeking to corrupt all of God's creation. They were mixing animals together to form hybrid animals. They were also mix, you know, mixing plants, mixing everything together. They were just determined to completely mess up God's creative order. Part of the motive behind what they were doing was is to so mix up the human gene pool that it would be pos impossible for God to, br to bring forth that pure son of God that, you know, that, that would be the savior of the world. And therefore God looked down and saw that the earth was so corrupt that he decided that he was going to just flood and wipe everything out. But Noah found grace in his eyes and that's why Noah and his line was saved. In Matthew 24, verses, 39, uh, verses 37 to 39, Jesus said, As it was in the days of Noah, so shall it be at the coming of the Son of Man. So what was it like in the days of Noah? Just like I said, it was complete and utter chaos. There were, you, know, you had all kinds of hybrid animals you know, that, that these fallen angels through crossbreeding had created. You see, God did not create the T-Rex or the raptors and all these other terrifying dinosaurs that we see in, in movies like Jurassic Park. They were, genetic, they, they were genetically engineered and if you watch the movie Jurassic Park you can see that all of the dinosaurs, they actually show in the movie that they were genetically putting them together. That is exactly what the fallen angels were doing. But Jesus said that this kind of thing 
is going to happen just prior to his return. And therefore, the answer has to happen. Today, do we see evidence that we are moving back towards the days of Noah? And the answer is yes. Most people here probably have not heard of the trans, uh, transhumanist movement. If you have, you're in the minority. But I strongly encourage you to, you know, to do a Google search for transhumanism and find out what this movement is all about. The transhumanist movement are seeking to create superhuman beings by mixing, you know, by mixing animal and human DNA through uh, cybernetic implants by implanting machines in the brain to make, to make our brains more efficient because they feel that this is the next stage of man's evolution. In 1990, Transhumanist Max Moore said that transhumanism is a loosely defined movement that has developed gradually up over the past two decades. Transhumanism is a class of philosophies of life that seek the continuation and acceleration of the evolution of intelligent life beyond its current human form and human limitations by means of science and technology guided by life promoting principles and values. In a London Reuters article entitled Scientists Want to Debate on Animals and Human Genes, British scientists want to genetically engineer a mouse that can speak, a monkey with Down syndrome, dogs with human hands and feet, British scientists want to know if such ex experiments are acceptable or if they will go too far in the name of medical research. Maybe some of you uh, read an article about the, 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 uh, the Russians that cloned, uh, that, that cloned monkeys. Or maybe you've heard that, uh, that Barbara Streisand had her dogs cloned. This is, this, is, this is no longer science fiction. You know, people, you know, you know, animals th and things, this is all science that is, that is you know, actually being done. Ray Kurzweil, the director of engineering at, at Google, predicts that humans will become hybrids in the 2030s. This means that our brains will one day be able to directly connect to the cloud where there will be thousands of computers and those computers will augment our existing intelligence. He said that brains will connect via nanobots, tiny robots made from DNA strands. Our thinking then will be a hybrid of biological and non-biological thinking. He said, the bigger and more complex the cloud, the more advanced our thinking. By the time we get to the 2030s or the early 2040s, Kurzweil believes our thinking will be predominantly non-biological. In a Wall Street Journal report, SpaceX and Tesla CEO Elon Musk is backing a brain-computer interface venture called Neuralink. The company, which is still in the earliest stages of existence and has no public presence whatsoever, is centered on creating devices that can be implanted into the human brain with the eventual purpose of helping human beings merge with software and keep pace with advancement in artificial intelligence. These enhancements can improve memory or allow for more direct interfacing with computer devices. So again, this is not science fiction. The future is here. In Revelation chapter 16, verses 8 to 10, you see that you'll see t there are two plagues that are poured out upon those who receive the mark of the beast. But the point, the, the one thing I'd like you to notice is it says that despite the, the intensity of those plagues, 
the, the, the people who receive the mark of the beast do not repent. And it says, and they did not repent of their sins. They did not repent. And, I've, and when I read that you know, a while ago, I wondered, why would you not repent? If you, re you now get in uh, you know, retribution for your sins, why would you not repent? But if this technology becomes reality, which, uh, which most certainly it will, they probably will not be able to repent because they can't. Because if your thinking is no longer your own, how then can you repent? Regardless of the, the kind of punishment or retribution you're going to get from God. Let's get back to Revelation 17, I'll read verse 9. It says, Here is a mind which has wisdom. The seven heads are seven mountains or hills on which the woman sits. This is something also that I didn't know until I, until I started researching for this study. There are many cities in the world that actually are surrounded by seven hills. Brussels is surrounded by seven hills, and Brussels is the, is the, is the home to NATO, is headquartered in Brussels, and Brussels is also the headquarters of, of, the, of the European Union. And I remember in the 80s, you know, you know, that, that we ever, there all the speculation of the, who are the 12 kings, or, you know, the three have fallen and one has taken its place, and now you have you know, 12 becoming 10, and all the speculation is, is, it was, is Europe was going to become, uh, the Antichrist was going to come from Europe. But Brussels is the headquarters of, of the of, of EU. Mecca, which is the seat of Islam, is also sur uh, surrounded by seven, uh, seven mountains. Moscow, which is certainly not friendly towards the Jews, is also surrounded by seven hills. And Mo Moscow, I believe, is, is also featured in the, in the Issachar uh, Wars of chapter, uh, in Issachar chapter 38 and 39. I believe it's Moscow that's, that, that's the, the, the king of the north, you know, Gog and Magog. Then you've got Tehran, which is the capital of Iran. They're the sworn enemies of the Jews, but that is also surrounded by seven hills. And then Jerusalem itself is also surrounded by seven hills. However, none of these cities fit the description that we've seen in, the first, in, in Revelation 17, 1 to 6. The only city that fits this description is Rome, which is the, which is the, the city and capital where, the, where you know, of, um, the, the city and the seat of the Catholic Church. For more information on this, read Dave Hunt's book. If you can put uh, that slide on the screen. Read Dave Hunt's book entitled, A Woman Rides the Beast. He does a really good expose on, on this subject. And there's also a, a one hour video, that, a presentation that he does on YouTube that you can look up also if you're not able to get the book. But I recommend watching at least the presentation uh, presentation very interesting so we've now identified the woman as the Catholic Church that's the false religious system that is riding the beasts we go to uh, uh, back to Revelation 17 and we read 10 and, uh, verses 10 and 11 it says there are also seven kings five had fallen one is and the, and the other has yet to come and when he comes, he must continue a short time. The beast that was and is not is himself also the eighth and is of the seven and is going into perdition. Now, a, a, a couple of years ago, uh, you know, I, did a, I did a study called All Roads Lead to Babylon. And in that study, you know, I... I one of the things that I attempted to do in that study was to identify who the Antichrist is. Because I believe, you know, you know that the God, God, God doesn't leave his people in the dark. He wants us to know who this person is so that when, we see, when, when, when that person reveals himself, we as a church will know and, and, and know exactly, you know, what to do. And we're not going to be fooled by anything you know, that, you know, by, by the, any deceptions that he's going to use in order to gain power. 
John says that there are seven kings that we need to pay close attention to. Of these seven kings, five have already come and gone. Therefore, the first part of this riddle that needs to be solved is who, the, who are the first five kings that have fallen at the time that John wrote the book of Revelation. And I identified the five kings and I'm going to start with king number two and I'm going to come back to the, king, the first king I, because I believe the first king ultimately is who the Antichrist is going to be. The pharaoh of the time of the Exodus is certainly one of those kings because we see that he sought to destroy all the, all, all the children. Remember he said, you know, that throw all the, baby, all the male babies into the river Nile. So he certainly qualifies as one of those kings. Sennacherib, which was the king of Assyria, after he had taken the ten northern kings into captivity, sought to come down and, and capture this, uh, the southern kingdom. And when Hezekiah refused you know, you know, to open his gates, he, he threatened to annihilate the entire city. So he also qualifies as one of those kings. Third king is the king of Tyre. And the reason why he is, one of the, or he is on the list is because in Amos, he breaks the covenant that he has with the people of, uh, with, with the people of Israel and turns against them. And also in, in Ezekiel, verses uh, 28, verses 1 to 9, he is seen to be in league with, the, with, you know, with Satan. And essentially, you know, before that reason, you know, God you know, you know, passed his judgment on him and says that he's going to remove him from being king. The other person, and this is, this, this is the person that the most is written about, and that is Antiochus, uh, Antiochus Epiphany. And you can read all about him in Daniel chapter 11, verses 21 to 45. In Daniel chapter 11, you have a, he, he gives a whole you know, list of, of, you know, of, of events and he keeps talking about the king of the north, the king of the south, the king of the north, the king of the south. And that's essentially what, you know, what Daniel 11 uh, is, is all about. But one of those kings is Itaic, uh, history as identifies as Ataikus Epiphany. And I just want to point out a couple of uh, verses that, that will certainly qualify Antiochus Epiphany as one, of, as one of the five kings and probably the one that is most like the Antichrist because of things that he does that parallels things that the Antichrist is going to do when he uh, you know, appears on the scene. Daniel 11.31 and I'll read. It says, And forces shall be mustered by him and they shall defile the sanctuary fortress. Then they shall take away the daily sacrifices and place they're the abomination of desolation. This lines up with what Daniel says in Daniel 8 verse 11 that says, and he even exalts himself as high priest, as the prince of the host, and by him the daily sacrifices were taken away, and the place of his sanctuary was cast down. This lines up with what Jesus said in Matthew 24 when, he, when his disciples had come to him and said, how do we know that we're in the time of the end? You know, when are all of these things going to be? And one of the signs he gave to them, he says, therefore, when you see the abomination of desolation spoken of by the prophet Daniel, and what, where did we see that? That, that, very, that very abomination of desolation is going to be set up by Ataikos Epiphany, but the Antichrist is also going to repeat that when he comes and he is going to go into the temple himself and he's going to sit down in the temple himself and proclaim himself to be God. So he himself, rather than Antiochus Epiphany, set up an idol of Zeus in, in the temple and he sacrificed a pig in the altar, the most unholy, you know, unclean animal that you could possibly you know, sacrifice in the temple. But the Antichrist is going to defile the temple by actually claiming that he himself is God and, and, uh, and declare himself to be God. And he, he warns him, he says, when you see the abomination 
that are spoken of by, by the prophet Daniel standing in the holy place. Whoever reads this, let him understand. Let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. So basically saying, when you see this happen, get out. The second, the second verse I'd like to look at from Daniel 11 is Daniel 11 verse 36. And it says, then the king shall do according to his own will. He shall exalt and magnify himself above every god and shall speak blasphemies against the god of gods. This lines up with what Daniel says in, in Daniel 7.25 where it says, He, the Antichrist, shall speak pompous words against, against the Most High. So again, you've got Articus Epiphany and the Antichrist doing essentially the same thing. We see this again in Daniel 8.25, speaking again of the Antichrist. He shall even rise against the prince of princes. We also saw in Daniel 8.11 that he will exalt himself you know, against the prince of, of the host, you know, and, you know, namely Jesus. So therefore, Aetherius Epiphany is, a good can is definitely one of the five. Now, Nero was the king at the time of John, of, the, of John writing the book of Revelation. And Nero was probably the most ruthless of the Roman Caesars in terms of all the Christians that he slaughtered during, during his reign. So he certainly qualifies as, as the king that existed at the time of John's writing. So that this leaves the seventh king that John said that must remain for a little while. Now, in my previous study, I was focusing on kingdoms rather than kings, like empires, you know, like world empires. But what I should have focused more on is kings. And the seventh king, actually, that fits most closely is Hitler. What did Hitler do during his, you know, during his reign, which is the Third Reich, which is essentially his kingdom? And that is he slaughtered six million Jews. So certainly he qualifies as that king who is to come. However, Hitler did work you know, with, you know, you know, with the, the Muslim Brotherhood during World War I, uh, World War II, you know, to capture Israel because he did try to capture Israel as, you know, on, 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 as part of his you know, uh, empire. But unfortunately, as we know, you know, didn't succeed. So he is the seventh king. This leaves king number one. And in my study, I did identify Nimrod as being the first king. Nimrod is the only person who was worshipped worldwide. And the, only, and the reason why I say that is because at the time of Nimrod, there weren't, there weren't nations. There were this one group of people. And that's why he built the Tower of Babel, so that he could remain king forever over, over all the peoples of the earth at the time. He's, he was the only true world dictator the Antichrist, when he comes, will be the second world dictator. Nimrod came to power through warfare and maintained his power through brute force. The Antichrist will do the same. Nimrod was the first king to declare war on God, and that was the whole rebellion of the Tower of Babel, that he wanted to set up his kingdom to rival the king, you know, God's kingdom. And the Antichrist is also you know, going to declare war on God and try to set up his kingdom you know, you know, and declare that his kingdom is stronger than the kingdom of God. Nimrod also aligned himself with Satan and created you know, the mystery religions, uh, uh, religion, which is why it's called Mystery Babylon, because the, all, the, all the false religions of the world essentially can be traced back to Nimrod. And lastly, Nimrod was, was the first man to be worshipped as God. He was the first man that, you know, that, you know, you know, to declare that I am a God and that he should be worshipped. Actually, it was his wife, after Nimrod's, after Nimrod's death, his wife said that the spirit of Nimrod had been resurrected and, he, and, 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 and now inhabited the sun. And therefore, Nimrod was now worshipped as the sun god. And his wife, Semiramis, claimed that she was also the moon goddess and said that she had descended from the moon in the, you know, the, from the moon and that claimed that she was a moon goddess. Later, she had a son called Tammuz, 
who she claimed that you know, was the son of Nimrod, and therefore you had the first mother, father, and son, the, the, the pagan trinity, so to speak. These are people that have been worshipped around the world and are still being worshipped today. Because at the tower, when the Tower of Babel, at the Tower of Babel, and all of the people were split into different language groups, they all took this religion of worshiping Nimrod as the as the sun god, Semiramis as the moon goddess, and Tammuz as the as the as as as, you know, as, as, as the son of, of the sun god, with them. If, if you can put the, uh, the the graphic of of, of Nimrod, Tammuz, and and Simramis on the screen, you can see that in, in various different countries around the world, th those are the names. You've got Aphrodite, you've got, you know, you, you've got Bacchus, you've so many different, you know, so many di different, name, uh, different names. They're all the same person. Back to Revelation 17, and I'll read verse 11. It says, The beast that was and is not is himself also of the eighth and is of the seventh and is going into perdition. Meaning to say that the Antichrist is going to be a reincarnation of one of these seven kings. And I believe Nimrod is going to be that reincarnation. And the reason why I say Nimrod is he's the only person that fits because he's the only one of them that is still to this day being worshipped around the world. The Jews worshipped him as Baal. If you read the Old Testament, what was one of the gods that they were constantly being told not to worship was Baal. Another god that they were constantly worshipped was Ashtoreth, which was the female you know, you know, fertility goddess. And in Ezekiel, you, uh, chapter 8, verse 23, you read about the women weeping for Tammuz, which was their son. So these were the gods that the Jews were, they, they, those are the names that, these, that, that Nimrod was known, known to by the Jews. He was known as Marduk, he was known as, uh, 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 you know, as, Mar, as, as Marduk, he, you know, and, uh, he was known by, uh, by, by, by De Dagon, you know, and, and so, but these, you know, the, the, this is the only person that, can, that, fits, uh, that, that can fit as the person who will come back from the dead and, and claim to be, you know, and, and, and uh, claim to be you know, the, the savior of the world that, ever, that the secular world is waiting, waiting for to come and save this planet. So, is the Antichrist alive today? The answer is no, he's not. However, the spirit of Antichrist is alive and well and is in the world today. Genesis, uh, John chapter 4, verses 1 and 3 says... Every spirit that does not confess that Jesus has come in the flesh is not of God. And this is the spirit of the Antichrist, which you have heard was coming and is now already in the world. Second John 1 verse 7, John repeats the same thing. He says, for many deceivers have gone out into the world. Those who do not acknowledge Jesus Christ is as coming in the flesh this is the deceiver and the antichrist. So the antichrist himself physically is not in this world, but his spirit is. And if you look at some of the false religions of the world, you can see how this, how this you know, spirit has, has deceived many into having a false understanding of who Jesus Christ is. Many, you know, the Jew, you know, the Jews deny that Jesus Christ exists altogether. Many, you know, there are many historical, you know, you know, uh, many, um, many uh, believe that he's an historical figure. The Jehovah Witnesses say that he's a created being. So it, there's, you know, a lot of, you know, deception. The ten horns. These are, you know, it's, uh, the ten horns are found in uh, Revelation 17. Uh, 12 to 13 and these 10 horns we're told are 10 kings my belief is and, and uh, is is and, and there's there's you know a secret talk of dividing the earth into 10 separate regions and that these 10 separate regions ultimately will be headed by 10 kings 
So I'm now really going to be, be racing through because I can see that my time is, 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 is almost up. Who are the 144,000? And I'm going to go quickly to the end here and say many have said that the 144,000 and who are they, who are they? I'll say this and, uh, you know, quickly. I don't believe that 144,000 is a literal number. I believe there's another meaning to what the 144,000 stands for. Because if you put all the names of the tribes together and the meaning of the name, if you can put that graphic up, so, uh, uh, put that graphic up real quick and put the meanings next to the name and then put all of those names together, it forms a paragraph. And I'll read it. It says, I will praise the Lord for he has looked on me and granted good, and granted good fortune. Happy am I because my wrestling with God is making me to forget. God hears me and is joined to me. He has purchased me a dwelling. God will add to me the son of his right hand. This is a prophecy about the, the first coming of Jesus Christ. Another thing you need to look at when you, when you look at the 144,000, the list, the tribe of Dan is missing. You have the tribe of Joseph and then you have the tribe of Manasseh. Why don't you have the tribe of Dan? So that's another clue that it's not a literal list of, of names. It, 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 is just, it has a more symbolic meaning. And how did I get this? If you go to Genesis chapter 5 and read the list of the ten patriarchs that are in Genesis chapter 5, again you get another prophecy. And I'll read that. If you can put that graphic on the board real quick, please. It says, Man has been appointed mortal sorrow, but the blessed God shall come down, teaching that his death shall bring the despairing rest. This is another prophecy of the coming Savior. Who are the two witnesses? This one is, e this one, this one is easy. Many have said that the two, witness, uh, the, two witness, the two witnesses are Enoch and Moses. I mean, uh, Elijah and Moses. We know that one of them is Elijah because Jesus himself attests that one of them is Elijah. And that's found in Matthew 11 verses 1 to 14. But the second one is Enoch. Moses died. We know that he did because he, was, he died and was buried on a mountain. The only other person who did not die a physical death and was taken directly to heaven other than Elijah was Enoch, and that is found in Matthew and that is found in Genesis five verses twenty one to twenty four. Who is the false prophet? Again, easy. If we, we've identified that the woman is the is is the Catholic Church, and therefore the false prophet is the head of this religious system. He, he is the figurehead of this, of this religious system, which would be the Pope. So there will be a future Pope of, of, you know, who, will, who will become the, the, the false prophet, who will promote, you know, who will unite the world behind the Antichrist. Now, I did a, 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 an extensive PowerPoint study on the Catholic Church where I really go into detail to prove this and see me and I'll, and I'll send you a you know, copy of the PowerPoint. But in it, you'll see that the work that the Catholic Church has been doing for the past two or, th you know, for the past hundred years, more recently through Pope John II, through, uh, through the, uh, Pope France, uh, Francis and others, to unite all the religions of the world under one religion, to make the Catholic Church the one global religion. It's trying to unite Islam, Hinduism, that there's a lot of effort being done behind the scenes to bring all the religions of the world together. And it's the Catholic Church that is spearheading this. So at some point, there will only be one religion, and that is essentially how the world will back the leadership of the Antichrist. Because what the Antichrist is going to say is, is that the reason why we have wars and all this turmoil in the world is because of religion. 
I believe that the Ezekiel war will be the final war. And at the end of that war, you know, the Antichrist will appear, I believe, at the end of the Ezekiel war. And this declared that in order to end all wars, all religions of the world need to come together under one, under one banner, and therefore we can eliminate war altogether. I'm going to do one more. I'm not going to be able to get to uh, Mystery Babylon, but I will do the Mark of the Beast, because I think that's important too. I do not believe the Mark of the Beast is going to be a barcode on the back of your hand or stamped on your forehead. The reason I don't believe that is, is tattoos can be removed. Also, I do not believe that the Mark of the Beast is going to be an RFID chip that's imb embedded under the skin. Now, some of you may have actually seen that there are companies that are actually experimenting with this technology now. But again, an RFID chip can also be removed. I believe that uh, the Mark of the Beast is, goes back to the human, the, what we read about transhumanism. And that it's going to be an implant, something that's irreversible. If, you've ha if you had one of these implants in your, in your brain that's connected to a network of supercomputers, then you, you cannot turn around now and say, oh, I repent and I, wanted, I, I, I believe the gospel. Because your thoughts will no longer be your own. They'll be controlled you know, you know, by, you know, by, by a machine. And who do you think is going to control this network of computers? The Antichrist. So I believe that the mark of the beast also more, more, uh, will also probably include some kind of genetic modification. You, and I believe that Satan himself you know, will somehow implant his, find a way of getting his DNA mixed in with human DNA. It's going to be attractive to many people because who wouldn't want to live forever? And that's probably how it's going to be sold. Oh, we've solved cancer, we've solved this. If you come and join me, we'll give you the, the, the gift of eternal life. And people will be rushing to come and, you know, you know, to come and receive it. But it's going to change their DNA. It's going to change the very nature of who they are. They will no longer be human beings. And therefore, they will be, no longer be redeemable. And that's why when you read and it says, and they, and they blaspheme the God, they blaspheme the God of heaven, and they shook their fists when he was pouring out all of these judgments upon them, this is why they, they, they could not repent. Not that they didn't want to, but because they could not. They were no longer human. So I thank you for <laughs> bearing along with me. So I'll just uh, bring... You know, bring uh, bring this study to a close. Thank you ever so much for coming, but I implore you, look into these things yourself and verify yourself that these things are true. If I look my take game, thank you for this uh, opportunity. Thank you for everything that you gave me uh, opportunity to say. I just um, pray that um, this uh, study will indeed you know, be a blessing to those who have heard it. In Jesus' name, amen. You guys will stand for this last song. <clears throat> and just want to encourage you, let's just join one more song just to praise him and thank him for everything that he's done for us and for revealing his truth to us that we get to know him here now and that we get to spend eternity with him one day.
always good. God bless you guys. Have a good rest of your week.